very fortunate today to have Dr. Paul Anderson with us, uh, who's a professor at the University of Wisconsin in the Department of Orthopedics and Rehabilitation, as well as an adjunct professor in the Department of Neurosurgery and an adjunct professor in the Department of uh, Bioengineering. And as you know, this is also the week for our annual Lecoq Lectureship. And so uh, having heard uh, Dr. Anderson speak several times on a wide variety of topics and having had the opportunity to discuss some of these issues with him, uh, we are really fortunate that he's uh, come out here and uh, joining us for uh, the rest of the week. And so uh, today Dr. Anderson is going to uh, talk about prevention of surgical site infection. And his work on this goes back uh, at least, I would say, about 25 years. And uh, in fact, he did some of this when he was uh, here uh, on the faculty at Harborview. And he did it in conjunction, uh, amongst with others, with uh, Dr. Patch Dellinger from the Department of General Surgery, who also uh, has joined us uh, this morning. I think everybody here who's been here a while knows that Dr. Dellinger uh, has also done a lot of work on surgical site infection uh, that has really led to changes in how we practice. And so with that, I'm going uh, to invite Dr. Anderson uh, up uh, here for Grand Rounds. Thank you, Howard. Yeah. Uh, are you, are you mic'd up? I think I am. Yeah. Thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction. It was great seeing some of my old uh, past colleagues here. Uh, they certainly all taught me a lot about surgical site infections. Uh, and uh, yeah, my first uh, research project at Harbury with, with, with Dr. Dallinger and how to reduce surgical site infection and in open fractures. But this I'm going to, today we're going to primarily uh, talk about elective kind of surgery. So just, uh, I don't have any financial disclosures. Uh, I'm not pro-surgical site infection in any way financially. And, but I do feel like the three monkeys. I've never had one, never seen one. I really don't know what it is. Uh, but uh, uh, this was uh, uh, Lord Moynihan back in British Journal of Surgery. He is an abdominal surgeon. Patch probably knows who this guy is. And he said uh, every operation is an experiment in bacteriology, which is, still remains true today. But I, I do want to thank my partners who had a lot of surgical site infections for uh, allowing me to study them. So the objectives are we're going to uh, learn the pathophysiology of how these occur, measure effectiveness of care bundles, which is the standard prevention package now, apply a systems approach to prevention, uh, look for improvement opportunities during all phases of care, and then I'm going to try to use as best I can an evidence-based approach. So first of all, how are we doing? This is the best data, although it's old and out of date now, and we should do a lot better than this, but this was from the CDC uh, National Health Work Na Safety Network, and they collected data on about 300 arthroplasty patients, and you could see the effects of hip arthroplasty slightly higher than knee arthroplasty. Again, this was from uh, 2011, was this was uh, published. It was 1,500 hospitals. This allowed them to collect a lot of data on comorbidities and risk factors so they could do risk stratification. This is not risk stratified. So these for these five procedures which were collected, these were the risk factors that turned out to be positive uh, in those infections that led to higher risk of infection independently uh, found on multivariate analysis. But uh, basically, these in red are the ones that consistently show up both in the NSH data as well as any of the studies in orthopedics. It's gender, diabetes, ASA score, wound class, age, procedure duration, and BMI. Not surprising, we know those are the risk factors. And so these are the risk factors that you need to think about and potentially target to try to lower that infection rate. So uh, they took this data and they created a new way to look at it which built in the risk stratification. Risk stratification is really important because every surgeon I know always says, I take care of sicker patients, that's why I have higher rates of infection. Well now we can measure that uh, and they took those procedures, they created some complicated formulas and now you can calculate what's called a standardized infection rate, or SIR, 
which is your infection rate divided what is anticipated based on the case mix that you have. And, and so a uh, SIR of one is what is expected. So if you're at one, you're doing pretty well. If you're less than one, you're doing very well and, and you're better. So I thought we'd have a little comp Rose Bowl competition between Wisconsin and, uh, and Washington, and I really thought Wisconsin was going to win because I, I frankly don't, haven't had an infection since I left Washington. Uh, but uh, actually, the, uh, Washington is sur a .9, which is pretty good. That's below one, below one. So the state of Washington is actually doing well. Total knees doing .86. Wisconsin beats you in knees. You beat us in hips. And this one's a little bit embarrassing to me since I'm a spine surgeon, is that uh, surprisingly, despite Dr. Bellabarba and Brantford uh, and Wagner, uh, their surgical site infection is 0.61. Maybe that got better after Ted retired. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, I suppose if I come back to Washington, maybe I can correct that uh, difference there. But uh, despite what you might think when you're at Harborview, the, the infection rate in Washington is actually quite low. So these are very good. Both states, I think you would say, are doing quite well. And these are from three months ago data over the last two years. This is my data, and this is how I, and I don't know if you guys get this kind of data, but this would be really nice for the ortho department to have is, uh, this is for total hips, and these are our SARS plotted over time. Uh, these numbers have only been being collected since 2017, so we can't go back right now. Uh, and uh, the university, or this is my data, we were doing quite well up until late last year, and we had a big spike. And anybody? Uh, oh, okay. And uh, at the end of last year, July of last year, we had a transition. We brought in five new surgeons, three from a community hospital that we absorbed, as well as two new faculty put a lot of stress on the system, and lo and behold, our infection rates started climbing. Uh, I think that's the explanation. We, we, we've worked on trying to improve that, and we'll see if we made any addition. But this is the kind of stuff, if you follow this, you start seeing spikes. You can now do interventions. Here's the spine fusions. Again, we saw the same spike. We didn't have new spine surgeons. We had the same crew, so we couldn't explain that. We did have a busier service because of being jammed up. That's one possibility. But we looked at the number. Unfortunately for me, the neurosurgeons get involved into our data for spine fusions, and the neurosurgeon data is red, and the ortho spine is in green. So that's the explanation there, at least what I give it as the explanation. Uh, if you're interested, the Washington State Department of Health gives the infection rate for hip and knee arthroplasty. Don't do it for spine. For every hospital in the state of Washington, so you can go through and if you're at a community hospital, you can see what their infection rate is. Keep in mind, this is consumer friendly. This is really built for consumers, so they can shop on this. And so if you have high infection rates, you may want to look at those. And I, I don't want to call out any hospitals. These are just alphabetical. Uh, but I do know what, you, what your infection rate is, if you want to know. So what are the pathogens that we're fighting? This is, again, CDC numbers. And of course, for orthopedics, these are the gram positive cocci, and that's really skin floor is what we are fighting. That counts for about two-thirds of the patients. For some reason, they didn't break out uh, MRSA in this analysis. Uh, and then we have a few 10% uh, of gram uh, negative rods, uh, the typical uh, uh, colonic type of bacteria. The problem with this data for us is that it's the uh, CDC only classifies infections out to 30 days which we know for orthopedics is not long enough. And it particularly, it doesn't cover uh, propionobacter uh, acnes, or which, uh, which I'll talk about in a minute. So where do the organisms that cause surgical site infection come from? That's interesting. They, uh, they are endogenous or exogenous or hematogenous. And uh, so uh, they're on us. They, we, the patient brings them to the operating room, or we introduce them or they go through the bloodstream for some way. Well, uh, if you look at studies where they did nasal swabbing, they were positive for staph species. They typed the staph species, and then they correlated the surgical site infection to that staph species. What you find is about 80% of the time, that organism was in the patient before they got to the operating room or before they even came in the hospital. So the bugs, 80% of the time, are endogenous, brought to the operating room by the patient. 
and we just happen to spread them around and dump them in the wound somehow. So it's really endogenous organisms make up the majority of them. It's, so it certainly gives us a target for decolonization, identification decolonization. Well, how did it get spread around? Well, most probably most type, typical will be hand contact to healthcare workers. That's why it's important to always rub and use gloves where it's appropriate. And then the operating room, you have to worry about things like air quality. And I will talk about the, the uh, fluid dynamics of air quality uh, later on. Uh, I want to give a call out to Dr. Matson, who has really led the understanding of this phenomenon of propionobacters, which is now called cutibacterium acnes for some reason, apparently genetically, it's not propionobacter. And that these organisms are gram uh, positive rods that are anaerobic and they reside in the pilosebaceous glands and they are not sterilized well by the traditional skid preps and you cut through them and you just release them into your wounds and a high percentage of failed shoulder surgeries will grow this and I don't need to go into this. Interestingly, a lot of people with getting uh, fusions for low back pain who have very bad discs with edema in their end plates, if you culture them, they grow propionobacter out of their discs. So it may be a much more prevalent cause of disease that we know about, maybe chondrolysis, for instance, in the shoulder after marcaine injections. Maybe it has nothing to do with marcaine, maybe it has to do with P. acne. Uh, and of course, there are latent P, uh, prosthetic joint infections. And unfortunately, we don't have any real specific methods to treat these, although I'll let Dr. Matson comment on his theories. Uh, so I'm going to try to use an evidence-based approach. Best results are obviously uh, randomized controlled trials, systematic reviews, meta-analysis, guidelines. This is typical. Every organization in the world that does these kinds of things. Uh, but I'm only going to comment on uh, articles that really focused on orthopedics or organisms typical for orthopedics as the gram-positive cocci. Unfortunately, a lot of the study is done through multiple specialties, and, and I don't think that helps us that much in orthopedics. Uh, however, most of the studies that are done are really quality improvement projects where they're comparing to historical uh, controls. They ha observe a problem, they say your infection rate such and such, they do an intervention or two, and then they remeasure it and show improvement. And that's how the surgical site infection literature is filled with these types of art articles. And you can argue the merits of that. Uh, but what I do see when you read this is that many of the randomized controlled trials, systematic reviews, meta-analysis conflict with one another. And they get conflicting results. And uh, that leads to non-harmonizing guidelines, which is not helpful at all. Uh, and it really leaves us in the question of how do we interpret this when randomized controlled trials don't correlate with each other. So uh, I think what you need to do is a systems approach has to be multidisciplinary during all phases of care. Good metrics are, are important to choose and compliance is really important to measure. Obviously your infection rate and you need a surveillance program. You can't count on just M&M reports to document this. It has to be an ongoing effort, but it's really up to you to uh, try to, uh, you like my graphics here? So, uh, it's really up to you to make this happen. You have to have a desire and participate in these programs and be motivated to improve. Most common way of doing it nowadays is what's called bundles, where you take a series of actions during different phases of care. This is, I think, <clears throat> to me, one of the best uh, documents on prevention of surgical site infection is from last year by World Health Organization. And their bundle included 26 different things you could do, and they'd go through each one of those and put the literature and make common sense recommendations. I, I think this is actually a better document than like the CDC has a similar document as well, but I really liked this one, the way they laid it out. So how are we doing uh, on these bundles? Are these things effective? Is it worth the effort? This is one from Pediatric Orthopedic Surgery. It's actually published in a nursing journal, so I assume this is a nurse. And they, she uh, got a multidisciplinary team, and they did a quality improvement program. It developed a surveillance program, compliant, measured compliance, involved all stakeholders. And this is pediatric, so it went from 4%, 3.2% to 0% after the intervention probably effective uh, treatment. 
Uh, here's a high-risk spine bundle. So they did four interventions for what they deemed were high-risk spine patients, which accounted for about one in five of their patients. And again, you can see that black line after the introduction, immediate fall in the risk of surgical site infection and by 75% decreased rate uh, with just four interventions done at one time on it. But this was just looking at a very high-risk group. Another spine bundle, this is out of the Mayo Clinic. They had five spine surgeons. They're all doing something different. So they harmonized them starting in 2007. And then as these newer techniques came on stream, they started adding them. So they weren't all added at one time, but over a period of time. But you can see a 6% infection rate in spine is enormously high. Uh, that, uh, so, but they dropped it down to 1.5%. Uh, and again, these bundles were added in at different times, but very effective. So where, uh, uh, what is the overall arching theme here? Well, you want to optimize the patient before you get them to the operating room. You want to reduce their bacterial burden that they're bringing with them. Remember, it's endogenous organisms. You want to minimize contamination during surgery. You need to leave healthy uh, perfused tissue and get an assist with antibiotics. Uh, so I'm going to talk about phases of care because each of these have a role. Uh, Pre-op optimization is probably most important than what you do before surgery, before the patient goes back to the operating room. And then interoperative, I'll talk about facilities and personnel, uh, antiseptic methods, and then uh, wound closure, what you can do at wound closure, and then finally, what do you do after surgery? So I'm going to use the Anderson evidence-based guidelines here. These are color-coded. Green means it's universally accepted in all guidelines and it's based on high quality data and it really is something you must do. Blue is that all guidelines uh, accept it and there's some data that, that supports it. Uh, yellow is that there's conflict, conflicting evidence or there's conflicting guidelines about it. And red is dogma and something you probably shouldn't do and may actually be harmful. So here is pre-admission optimization. Again, we know that we try to get this patient as good a shape to uh, go through surgery so they recover better, but one of the most important things is try to make them uh, uh, so they don't get a surgical site infection. And you do things like uh, set BMI limits, glycemic control, smoking, nasal screening for bursa and uh, MSSA, showers and chlorhexidine dressings. And uh, when I look at these interventions, and I'll go through a few of these, uh, the ones that you absolutely need to do is have an optimized uh, patient with diabetes. Uh, try to get people to stop smoking and screen for MSSA and MRSA. Antimicrobial showers are con uh, a little bit controversial. And then the other ones, setting BMI limits, although you'll certainly lower your infection rate, uh, that's kind of more of a philosophical thing. And, and chlorhexidine dressings, which I'll talk about. So BMI, we know it's an associated risk factor for SI, SSI infection. There's a dose response kind of curve. Uh, there are no specific guideline cutoffs. I know our arthroplasty people in our institution have a BMI of 40. A lot of other people have 37.5, some people even 35 for arthroplasty. We do the same thing for elective spine surgery. We have a BMI cutoff of 40. Uh, whether that's right or not, I don't know. Uh, unfortunately, there's no evidence that weight loss, forcing patients to lose weight and then operate them really changes the risk because it, it may be more of a physiologic problem than exactly just to do with their obesity. So sometimes you just have to say no. And, and that's one thing, particularly for the younger people. You just, you take somebody of BMI 55 and do a total knee replacement. Don't be surprised if pus is draining out later on. Smoking cessation, uh, does, does smoking cessation really reduce it? Well, there's, there's meta-analysis and studies that show that short-term, uh, that is, if they quit right before surgery, between two and week, four weeks of surgery, actually does not reduce your risk of surgical fight, site infection. This is a risk ratio is 1.22. Uh, but if you, smoke, if you quit smoking for more than a month, it does become significant. So if you're going to operate on somebody, and like, for instance, if you're going to do a spine fusion, I think you must uh, stop them from smoking for at least a month before surgery. So uh, it has to be greater than four weeks. Stopping at the time of surgery doesn't help you now. Most of my patients say, yeah, I, I quit smoking last night and I'm not gonna pick it up again. That's not gonna help you reduce infection. Uh, 
Diabetes, the uh, American Endocrine Association is, gives guidelines about glycemic control. We know that outpatient, they want hemoglobin A1C to be less than seven, but what about for surgery? Well, actually, they don't any, make any uh, hemoglobin A1C recommendations for surgery. What they do say is good control. They don't actually define that very well, but what everybody has come up with is you want the, the uh, blood sugars about uh, consistently less than 200 before surgery. Uh, I like to say for two weeks, so if somebody's got a hemoglobin A1C of nine, call their internist, get them to get better control, get the blood sugars consistently below 200 for the week or two before surgery. And certainly in the morning of surgery, if that blood sugar is 300 or something, you really seriously should consider canceling the case if, uh, uh, if you can. So, and after surgery, you wanna maintain blood sugar at 200. We don't need perfect control. We don't want that because you risk uh, hypoglycemia, but you do want it below 200 consistently before and after surgery. Screening and eradication. Do you guys do MRSA and screening on your joints? I would presume you do, yeah. And this is, to me, the single most important intervention you do. So if the residents go out and you're going to a community where the is not to do screening, you need to introduce this. Because this, to me, when we, inter we put this intervention in, we dropped our <laughs> infection rate by two thirds within one year, just, and this was the only intervention. Again, organisms are endogenous. Some people have large reservoirs of virulent organisms. Uh, the MRSA carriers and MSSA carriers are at significant increased risk of surgical infection, and eradication uh, decreases their risk of preoperative eradication. So uh, the reservoirs are actually nares, axilla, groin, and perianal. We only test the nasal. Uh, if I tried to get perianal, my physician assistants would all quit. So uh, we do that, and we use PCR, so we get the results back within six hours usually, uh, and then we can do intervention if they're positive. Uh, 20 uh, to 25% of people will be, MERS, will be MSSA positive, and 3 to 5% with MERS. I don't know what they are in Washington, but I assume they're very similar here. Right, Patch? Is that about what you have? Yeah. So, uh, well, what is the relationship uh, of being a staff carrier in SSI? Odds ratio 5.9. So if you carry MRSA, MSSA, I'm sorry, uh, MSSA or MSRSA, you're, you have about a six times higher rate of infection. And if you eradicate or decolonize for MSSA carriers, you bring your risk factor very close to unity again. So you bring it back down. Unfortunately for MRSA, you have a 10 times higher risk of surgical site infection if you're a MRSA carrier, and eradication only brings you down to about three times higher risk, so that's about the best you can do. But those are very important numbers. Uh, so here was the, really the first study that I saw was by David Kim out of Boston, 7,000 patients at New England Baptist Hospital, used historical controls, and they screened people and decolonized them Oops. And the decolonization or eradication was with uh, five days of chlorhexidine 2% baths and mupericin, which is antibiotic, uh, active against staph in the nose for five days. And what they found was that their uh, infection rate for staph species went from 0.45 to 0.19 with this screening. This is the only intervention. So it significantly dropped the infection rate. This was another study done uh, on the same kind of idea, except this one, they randomized the treatment after they were positive for screening. So they were screened positive, then they randomized should you decolonize or not. Uh, and this included general surgery as well as neurosurgery. I think neurosurgery and ortho have very similar uh, bio burden, so they're very similar. General surgery obviously has different organisms. Um, and what they found was a uh, hospital-acquired infections, these were primarily things like ammonia or sepsis, significantly it was in half in the patients who de were decolonized. And similarly, uh, eight, uh, four or five-fold decrease in surgical site infections with decolonization. So yes, screening is the most effective means other than antibiotics alone to prevent infection. <clears throat> 
We have now, we found difficulty with compliance to muparicin, which is a nasal ointment, and we are now trialing uh, betadine nasal swabs instead. These actually appear to be more effective than the muparicin, and these are nice because you can do them right before surgery, so we're doing them pre-op holding now. Uh, and it avoids the risk of antibiotic resistance. The muparicin is an antibiotic, and there are now organisms showing up muparicin-resistant staph species. Uh, so we're going to trial this. The uh, early results from other studies look quite favorable, and this is uh, cheap and pretty easy to, to put into your system's package, much easier than muparicin turned out to be. We found things like muparicin is expensive. Medicare won't pay for it because we're not treating an infection. Uh, a lot of pharmacies didn't even have it, and, and so patients couldn't even get it. Uh, so there are a lot of burdens to that. This one is going to, I think, be much easier for compliance alone. Well, the other part of the eradication was pre-op showers, but do these actually work uh, in general? Uh, and the idea is we decrease the bacterial burden. Typically, we're giving people uh, Hibiclens, and if they're not a carrier, they will get uh, supposed to shower the day before and the morning of surgery. Uh, the one thing you have to remember, this works as an antiseptic, so it needs contact time, and a lot of people just wash with it and immediately wash it out. It's a lot better if you uh, leave it on for five minutes. Our head of our infectious disease, a guy named Dennis Mackey, uh, he uh, recommends people shower, lather with it, and go to bed with it. <laughs> on, because the longer you have it on you, the more effective the, uh, it is. However, Thank you. However, if you look at randomized controlled trials, guidelines about sh the use of showers alone, and I'm not talking about the screen positive patients, uh, really none of these recommend uh, chlorhexidine shop. What they recommend is you uh, use, uh, take a shower with soap, and you can use it, you have an option to use this, but it's not a strong recommendation because the randomized trials show no difference in surgical site infection. So. Uh, just getting a patient to use soap is probably as good. So it's not a very strong recommendation for that. I was really excited about this one. This is sage cloths. I don't know if you've seen these here. But these are uh, dressings that have, are saturated with uh, uh, hibiclens or chlorhexidine. And the idea here is you wash the site or leave it on the site, surgical site, to try to decrease the skin colonization. You do it the night before surgery, AM, pre-op holding. I had a lot of hope that this would work great for the shoulder patients where we see these uh, latent infections. Um, and they're fairly cheap. A and the results are actually quite impressive. This is a, a meta-analysis I did of four studies. These were all historical controlled studies. And it cut the infection rate in half using these sage cloths in that manner. Uh, so they're low cost, low risk, and they are incorporated in a lot of guidelines and bundles. Um, not sure if, if it uh, really the quality studies are not great to prove that. We, we instituted this uh, at our hospital um, a little bit over my objections because I, I thought it really had we should trial it first. And we had four patients who were going to have shoulder surgery get canceled because they had blistering and things from the dressings. So um, I think if you use this, it's worth trialing it to make sure it's going to work first. Uh, we've kind of backed off using it now. So the morning of surgery, you still have a role. It's not too late to do things. And I'm a, uh, you should check the skin, make sure the skin has integrity. Re, uh, for those who are known diabetics, check their blood sugars. Uh, Pre-warm the patient, which I will talk about. Uh, hair clipping, I'll talk about. And I'll talk about pre-op antibiotics, the, the dressings I've already talked about, and the beta nasal swab I've talked about. So the ones you must do are check for diabetic control. And uh, recommendations are if that patient's blood sugar is over 250, you really need to consider canceling the surgery so they have poor glycemic control. Uh, and we're obviously going to get pre-op antibiotics for most cases, although you can argue about arthroplasty or uh, arthroscopy if you're not putting an implant in short cases, and most of hand surgery probably do not require antibiotics. Uh, things, other things that are you should do, probably do, but are not really proven by evidence: skin check, warming, hair clipping, and, and the betadine swab. Uh, 
so this was one of my patients uh, who I was going to do a microdiscectomy on. Unfortunately, he had a pile, infected pyelonidal cyst, and pus was coming out his butt. Fortunately, I saw that before we did anything, and my fellow got to participate in a pyelonidal cyst excision instead of a microdiscectomy that day. Um, so you want to make sure there's no active infections. And uh, recently, I've been working with dermatology on how to clean up the skin in these people with acne to try to prevent the acne latent infections. And uh, this, uh, she uh, really would emphasize that send them to derm because she thinks with a month of treatments of their magic potions and lotions, they can really clean up people with, uh, who have a lot of acne or lesions on their skin. And it's probably worthwhile be interested to see what Dr. Matson would think about that. Uh, but uh, don't be afraid to cancel surgery if the skin looks lousy. Uh, you know, we know that in trauma, you got fractured blisters and stuff, you don't really want to operate. But uh, adolescent scoliosis would be a really good one because they frequently are of the age where they have a lot of acne on them. Now, we know that you shouldn't uh, shave uh, because that just scars the skin and opens up portals for bacteria to live, and you should uh, uh, use clipping. But the question is, where should it be done? Uh, when you do it in the operating room, you are actually pushing bacteria and, and particles up in the air that are being recirculated in the room, maybe dropping down on the instruments. And most of the bundles uh, or guidelines really recommend you do this in pre-op holding. Uh, there's a lot of reasons not to like to do that in pre-op holding, uh, and mainly patient comfort. Uh, and we have not, in my hospital, I've not been able to institute this even though it's a recommendation. <laughs> Uh, have not got buy-in from anybody on that, uh, particularly the pre-op holding nurses who really don't like to change anything. Uh, so keep that in mind when you're uh, clipping. Try to uh, try not to stir it up too much when you're when you're doing that. Uh, and of course, some people even argue we shouldn't shave the skin at all. Uh, I don't know about that. Obviously, one of the more important things we do is administer antibiotics, and for us primarily going to be fighting the gram-positive cocci. They should go in within an hour of surgical incision, <clears throat> and you should only give them for 24 hours. And there's recent push or evidence that just maybe one dose, even in arthroplasty, is enough, and I'll share that with you. Uh, this is an uh, article published. Uh, notice Dr. Dellinger is the second author on this. And this is the guidelines I use, and we use an ortho for preventing surgical site infection. And just a couple of things uh, is that it's weight-based, is they find that uh, morbidly obese people need more antibiotics, um, and that uh, you should avoid using clindamycin. We almost can't use clindamycin anymore because of the risk of C. diff. I think the risk factor for C. diff infection if you use perioperative clindamycin is 30, so 30 times higher risk of C. diff infection in orthopedics. Uh, so try, so in that case, we would, uh, the alternative is vancomycin, and that's what I would use. Uh, and for spine, big spine procedures, I would also use intra-wound vancomycin, those people who uh, are, are given vanco. Vanco is not as good a drug against MSSA, it's bacterial static in most concentrations against MSSA, unfortunately. So it's not as good a drug. Uh, but that's why I add something in the wound as well. But again, it's weight-based, 15 milligrams per kilogram. And then if you're a carrier, you obviously want to use a uh, carrier for MRSA. You want to use vancomycin. But because vancomycin is not very good against MSSA, you still should use a cephalosporin combined. Uh, so. Uh, so. Uh, those are kind of the changes. Hopefully, they're already incorporated in your, your protocols. Well, what about this timing of antibiotics? This is a great study out of the VA for arthroplasty. It was like 50,000, and they looked at the odds ratio of an infection, and you want the odds ratio to be less than one here. And they looked at when that antibiotic got put in and what was the risk of infection. And the sweet spot was, again, between 60 and zero. But notice that it really reaches a nadar maybe 30 minutes before surgery. And this has been one of my frustrations is last thing I do is there are the antibiotics and they get in the anesthesia says, oh, well, got, to, got to run them in. And I go out and wash and I come back and they're still, they're still running in. Don't cut the skin until they're in because you'll have some kind of violation and be called up by somebody's board. But, uh, and obviously they need to be in before you inflate a tourniquet. But if you look at this number, the, the 
the time was, oops, sorry about that. The uh, time was better if you were like 30 minutes before, and so I have been unable to get anesthesia to run them in earlier. Uh, they are so afraid of running them in too early, uh, uh, which is possible with my anesthesia because they could take an hour to set the room up, uh, but uh, uh, they're, they're reluctant to. And so I think as a systems, we've got to figure out how to get anesthesia to get these antibiotics in maybe 15 to 30 minutes before incision, if at all possible. Um, here's a, the recent study just published this year uh, out of Philadelphia. Uh, and they had 20,000 patients, and this is a retrospective cohort type study. Uh, they used in 4,200 patients a single dose of antibiotics. This is all for arthroplasty. And then the rest had gotten standard 24 hour dosing. And really, there's no statistical difference. But actually, the singles did a little bit better. This was not statistically significant. So this kind of uh, implies that a single dose is probably good enough. And this was out of Parvisi is really the, are the authority on periprosthetic joint infections. This is only one study. I think we need more data before we adopt this. But it does give arthroplasty surgeons heartburn to think about one dose. They, they all, uh, you know, Howard's here, <laughs> is vomiting right now. So, uh, and they did a nice study. They did uh, the analysis multiple ways. They looked at the absolute risk. They adjusted for risk. They used propensity matching. They just took high-risk patients. So they took all the different groups you could possibly think of and, and never made a difference. Pre-op warming was an interesting one. I didn't really know anything about it. All of a sudden, our nurses started doing this. So the idea is you warm the patient before surgery. They're wearing essentially a bear hugger type of thing. Do you guys use this at all? Yeah. And what is the evidence that this works? Well, patients go in the operating room warmer, and they stay warmer during the case. Whether this makes a difference in surgical site infection, I don't know. Uh, nobody does, but they, their temperatures certainly are a lot better during surgery if you pre-op warm them. This is the latest article about this, but this has been a series that show the red is the pre-warm patients. And for uh, us, is that uh, significantly because patients maintain normothermia better, there's greater room com uh, comfort. I mean, how many people like it when anesthesia turns the temperature up to 80 degrees and we start sweating, we're wearing lead, and we fatigue? And uh, patients are very satisfied. Patients love this. They probably love this more than they like me. Uh, and so far, there's been no difference in surgical site infection. So this is something that I think you should really consider doing. Uh, so now we're getting, we finally got the patient in the operating room. What the heck are we going to do now? And these are facility kind of personnel issues, air handling, minimized traffic, oxygenation. I'm not going to talk about oxygenation. That's kind of uh, obvious. You want to maintain high FiO2. I've already talked about hair clipping. And then some simple things, covering instruments and then the hypothermia <laughs> issues. So all of these five, the first five are things you should definitely do, and there's evidence of you should do them, and they're in almost all guidelines. The temperature one I made yellow because it uh, has not been proven in orthopedics at all that that's important. In fact, there's contradictory evidence. So air quality, I, I, I have a master's in chemical engineering in fluid dynamics in gaseous medium. So this was kind of interesting looking at this. This kind of brought me back to my days in engineering. Uh, and uh, the American uh, Society of Architects have guidelines for how to design an operating room. And uh, it's, uh, it's accepted by the CDC. And you want a minimum of 25, something around 30 air exchanges per hour in that room. Keep in mind that more is not better, because if you have more air exchanges, you increase the velocity of the air molecules. And that actually creates turbulence and stirs up particles. So you want a specific set. You can't, too much is actually bad as too little. It should be HEPA filtered air. It needs to be a positive pressure room with the uh, vents at the bottom of the, of the room. And with typically it's coming in, the air is coming in from the ceiling. And this is the typical vertical room where the air is coming in from the ceiling. There's usually a platen where the air comes in and then it, it goes out. This would be a horizontal. Some operating rooms are set up horizontally. These, are, I think, are less good because there's invariably personnel in the way that are blowing across, and the, all the bacterium particles on the person, the stand in between you and the bed will get blown on. So there's a lot of talk about laminar flow. Uh, 
And what laminar flow is, is that the air movements come down and stay in a line and go out, uh, rather than turbulent hair where, or turbulent flow where it's all mist and there's a lot of eddies and recirculation. That's term, uh, and the most important factor that uh, creates a difference is the flow rate of those air molecules. So oxygen, nitrogen, it's the flow rate. So you want to have them actually slow down. It sounds a little bit not intuitive, but you want them a slower rate, they'll maintain laminar flow. As you increase the velocity, you will get turbulent flow. There are other factors uh, like density and heat, temperature, humidity, but those are pretty well controlled, but really it comes down to the speed. That's why those air exchanges, you don't want too many. We found a, uh, we investigated this in our operating rooms. We had 28 operating rooms, and there was as much a difference of 10 between one operating room and another in air exchanges. So we had to com come in and kind of correct that because we had some air handling problems we weren't aware of. Uh, the whole idea about laminar flow rooms started with John Charnley, who developed the total hip. They had an unacceptably high infection rate, but they weren't using pre-op antibiotics. And so laminar flow made a big difference uh, then when you weren't using. But once you gave patients the effective antibiotics, the effectiveness of laminar flow went out the door. And so you don't need special operating rooms for orthopedics as long as they meet the, uh, the standards I already laid out, we're fine. Uh, and, and you just, uh, and they have to be monitored apparently because like our hospital was out of compliance in a number of our operating rooms. Room traffic increases turbulence. That's what we want to avoid. And every time you open and close the door, you change that positive pressure and you create turbulent rather than laminar flow. Um, and its association with surgical site infection is less clear, but certainly if you put Petri dishes around and count particles and bacteria, this tend to, hundredfold difference if you have a room with a lot of people coming in and out. All guidelines recommend less traffic. What we have instituted is electronic communication in the operating room, and that has really cut down people coming in to ask stupid questions. Uh, they can now ask stupid questions on there electronically. So that is one systems thing that can be improved. Um, Here's another way of doing it. Uh, this is an interesting study out of Scandinavia. They looked at risk factors for joint infections, and they found that their left knees were infected 10 time, almost 10 times higher than their right knees. And all the knee surgery was done in one room. And they looked at the room, and the left knee was right next to the door where people came in and out of. And so they put a lock on the door, and magically their infection rate went down. So that's a pretty effective intervention. So this is, uh, so their infection rate went uh, down fivefold. Uh, so this is our operating room now. Uh, and I suggest that we all try to strive from not entering rooms for stupid conversations and social events and things like that, but also systems wide. We have to get nursing staff and anesthesia to buy into this and, and try to decrease the room traffic. <laughs> because I'm sure there's still way too much going on in your hospital. Uh, normal thermia is really a fight between us and anesthesia and nursing now as they crank temperature up. We tell them you got to lower that because uh, we're sweating into the wound. There's no doubt this physiologic uh, uh, effects of uh, normal thermia that are positive, increases white blood cell function, decreased bleeding, has some positive cardiac effects as well. Uh, and randomized controlled trials in general surgery, peds, and trauma all show reduction of surgical site infections in normal thermic patients, which is defined as temperatures uh, greater than 36 degrees. Uh, and it's frequently a guideline measure uh, for all surgeries, including orthopedics, although there's no basis for that in orthopedics. Uh, it's not evidence-based for us. The World Health Organization document, like I said, actually noted that uh, there is a problem with fatigue of surgeons and sweating if you raise the temperature, and they did not recommend for orthopedic surgery that uh, the temperature be over 36 degrees like uh, the CDC recommendations and uh, many other ones do. In fact, here's a study uh, just published by Yamada and Journal of Clinical Infectious Disease for orthopedic patients. 10% were hypothermic and seven hospitals in Japan and they found the odds ratio was 1.59 if you were normothermic compared to hypothermic. So you actually had a 50% higher rate if you were normothermic. 
than if you were hypothermic. Uh, unfortunately, the mortality was, was the opposite. It was much higher if you're a hypothermic than normal thermic. But the mortality rate for arthroplasty in orthopedics is generally very low. Uh, so anyway, lower surgical site infection. What about warming devices? Uh, this kind of guy is probably living downtown Seattle somewhere. Uh, and we have choices, forced air systems. Uh, anybody know what the temperature is of the air coming out of the bear hugger? forced air system, what do you think it is? I think it's 45, it can be 45 degrees centigrade. Uh, and it blows right up underneath us, right? And it also circulates particles from the floor because it blows down and then recirculates. And if you do particle analysis, it actually changes your laminar flow over the table into turbulent flow. Uh, there's other options, reflective blankets, which is what this is, and then you can do heating, electric coil heating, traditional type of heating blankets. And uh, this is a study published in the Journal of Arthroplasty. Uh, if you pre-warm the patient like I described before and bring them in warmer, uh, there was no difference between forced air systems and just having this patient uh, dressed in this thing. So I really think this is an opportunity for us uh, where we use this reflective blanket, which is cheaper than the bear hugger and also appears to be as effective. Um, there's been another one, a bugaboo, uh, uh, we studied this, is if you leave the instruments laying out there, bacterial particles are just falling on them during your case. And the same is true for your splash basin. And within 30 minutes, we were able to uh, grow uh, pathogenic organisms on those uh, trays. Uh, and we also did a simple experiment by covering them with a green towel, and that contamination went away. So that's a fairly cheap solution. So the nurses like to get all this stuff out and exposed. And like for me, I might do a five-level laminectomy and then do an instrumentation. And you know, five-level laminectomy with durable repair, that might be three hours. And those instruments are just sitting there exposed for three hours. Uh, so cover them or don't, I've tried to get the nurses not to open them. They, they like open them and make sure everything's there. And I understand that. So we have a little argument about that. The splash patient, typically at the end of the case, you're supposed to irrigate, right? Well, don't irrigate with that splash basin that's out there for three hours because that is filled with bacteria. So you're just introducing bacteria into your wound. So we do a new setup for that at the end of the procedure, or we do treat it like an open fracture. We have an IV bag and, and infiltrate with that as well. So don't, that splash basin is particularly bad. And we grew 37 organisms, different organisms out of those splash basins. We did like 50 patients. We just put a basin there. We didn't use it. And that wasn't even a basin with blood and stuff in it, where it's likely to be much more contaminated. <laughs> so antiseptic things you do in surgery, uh, you got to confirm the timeout. It's amazing how many times that we have compliance problems with that, where the antibiotics weren't in when we did the incision. And that gets you a big no-no. Um, you know, the hand washing is, the guidelines say you should do a scrub with a brush. Uh, and clean your fingernails as the first case, and then after that, use the alcohol-based uh, rubs. Uh, the skin prep, uh, I don't think there's any difference between chlorhexidine and iodinated products, uh, but they must be alcohol-based. You shouldn't use water-based betadine products, for instance. Chlorhexidine tends to have a longer mechanism of action, so in other words, it will keep the skin sterile for longer than, than the iodinated products. Uh, adhesive barriers have not been shown to be effective at preventing surgical site infections. You can certainly use them. It's not harmful, but they're not effective. We, must, we should double glove for orthopedics, including our personnel needs to be double gloving as well. Change, there's some argument about whether we should change gloves before you close, change instruments before you close, and then I'll talk about spacesuits. So these are the things that we know are effective, uh, repeating, confirming the timeout, hand washing, skin prep, and uh, double gloving. These other ones are, are certainly options for you. And I'll go through some of these. Spacesuits, they control the air exchange between the surgeon and patient, maintain laminar flow. It's widely loose, used in arthroplasty. Do you guys use spacesuits for arthroplasty? We use them, but, but I think we use them mostly for personal protection. Right. And registries show actually increased rate of, of prosthetic joint infections with spacesuits on. Uh, they certainly are protective for surgeons, uh, and I really question whether they're worth the cost and hassle. Uh, and what Howard said is what our surgeons say. We use them to protect themselves, but I think it's just dogma. That's what they've always done. Um, 
Here's one that's been kind of dogma for years is that you, the skin knife, as we know, and Dr. Matson has shown, when you cut the skin, you now have a contaminated knife that sits in the back table for 40 minutes. And you probably don't want to use that to like cut the annulus or something that's avascular with that device because you may introduce bacteria. So yeah, the dogma was to use a new blade, and now we've expanded that. Well, why don't we just get, when we're closing, new set of instruments, new gloves and gowns, and certainly we do that for trauma now. Uh, in a debridement of open fracture, we would reset up everything to close with. We're starting to do it for spine surgery. And some people even go to re-prepping the skin at the time of closure as well. Uh, these all lack conclusive evidence. They're certainly safe, easily adopted, and I think they should be considered uh, uh, as a possibility. And there's more dogma on how to close the wound and what kind of dressings to put on. Uh, I think uh, surgical principle is to consider your wound as like an open fracture and make sure you debride, devitalize tissue. Just think of it as an open fracture. You're over at Harborview. Just cut away any dead stringy tissue. Just get rid of it. It's just a nidus for, for possible infection. Uh, irrigation, I will have, uh, we'll go over that, and the use of antibiotic irrigation, intra-wound vancomycin, controversies over should you staple or, or suture, that's ongoing, and there's antimicrobial sutures, antimicrobial dressings, and then vacuum dressings. So I'll go through a bunch of these. Notice none of these are in green, uh, as the evidence is not conclusive, uh, but some of them make common sense uh, and have some scientific merit. I think debridement is... is kind of part of surgery we've learned and is probably useful. Irrigation and antimicrobial suture, sutures are, are certainly effective. Uh, and the other ones are kind of your options. So uh, wound management, like I say, treat it like an open fracture. Irrigation, the, you know, the standard barbecue thing, a solution is the pollution to dilution. Uh, but certainly antibiotic irrigation, adding uh, bacitracin or any other antibiotic in there has not been proven to be effective. It actually can be counterproductive. It, it does increase uh, uh, bacterial resistance and things and shouldn't really be used. Uh, antiseptic irrigation like uh, proviodine uh, has been shown to be effective in total joints and spine. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So this was a study, and it's amazing, this is the only study on betadine uh, use, uh, dilute betadine uh, for total joint arthroplasty. It was out of Rush. And it was a historical controlled study, 2,500 patients, three minutes of uh, dilute, I think it's uh, provo iodine, and then washed afterwards. And they significantly lowered the rate of uh, prosthetic joint infections from 0.9 to 0.15 with this. Everybody is pretty much, a lot of people are adopting this. But really, this is the only study, or one retrospective study. It's kind of amazing to me that this is not repeated. And I, I searched it last week. I couldn't find any new studies. Uh, so something needs further investigation, certainly something to consider. Vancomycin powder is uh, one of my favorites, uh, pixie dust in the wound. Uh, the idea here is we make very high concentrations of uh, vancomycin, which becomes bacterial cytal at that high MICs. It also, because you have such MICs, you're not likely to get bacterial resistance. So even our very conservative ID folks had no problem doing this, uh, and they didn't think they was likely to have antibiotic pressure, and they didn't have little uh, concern. There's a variety of ways of doing it. You can mix it just into the muscles. You can mix it in with the bone graft. There is some worry about cytotoxicity of high concentrations of vancomycin to osteoblasts or stem cells, so, so I personally am a little bit opposed to mixing it in with the bone graft, but I do mix it in with the muscles. Uh, this is a meta-analysis of 10 historical controlled studies, and, and they showed an 80% effectiveness uh, of vancomycin powder. This is all spine surgery. Odds ratio, yeah, went down to 0 0.19, so 80% effective with it. Uh, however, there are now three randomized controlled trials on the same thing that were negative. Now, two of these were in Asia, and their infecting organism was E. coli and a Syntobacter. And I figure if you got those organisms, you've got something else going on there, uh, if, if E. coli is your main pathogen in, our, in spine surgery. Um, well, what about closing the wound? And there's no more place in orthopedics where there's more dogma. Uh, 
many opinions. This is how we always do it. Uh, uh, you know, what do you, if you challenge somebody, why are you closing like that? What do you know? You, you know, and a uh, couple of uh, quotes, the greater the ignis, ignorance, the greater the dogmatism by William Osler. I think Steve Jobs said even better, don't be trapped by dogma, which is living with the results of other people's thinking. And uh, this is a recent uh, study or meta-analysis that showed absolutely no difference in orthopedics. And it doesn't matter what type of orthopedics, be total knee, total hip, or uh, trauma didn't make any difference in your surgical site infection. However, pay, uh, uh, it took less time to put staples in, as we know, but patients had more discomfort with staples. So you can do anything you want, although keep that, those two things in mind. Antimicrobial sutures, triclosan is a consumer product, uh, antiseptic that's used, started out in toothpaste, Colgate toothpaste has that in there, and they can coat it onto uh, sutures. Widely studied in abdominal surgery and is quite effective. It probably reduces in infections in half. However, it's conflicting results and there's no high quality studies in orthopedic surgery. So don't necessarily recommend its use. Uh, there's a lot of talk about advanced dressings. Uh, uh, I know uh, we, we argue about this because these are more costly and uh, the, you can get blisters. Uh, the advantage here is they're adhesive. They, people can take showers and things. They can, they can be impregnated with silver and other antimicrobials. Uh, and they do show a five to tenfold decrease in surgical site infection rates in total joints and in spine, but hip fracture rates had no difference. So it's certainly something to consider, although all the guidelines don't support the use. Wound vacs, uh, we know what they do. They re improve oxidation, remove fluid, the reduce bacterial propagation. They're very effective at open fractures and maybe as incisional wound vacs in the obese patient. Multiple investigations um, uh, show improved wound healing, but more blisting, but conflicts on the results of surgical site infections. Uh, it's certainly the guidelines recommend consideration in higher risk wounds such as trauma and then uh, diabetes, obese patients, which are oftentimes one of the same. Last thing is antibiotic cement. This remains controversial. Uh, few randomized controlled trials. There were two uh, and total knee had totally opposite results. One had better outcomes, one had worse outcomes. Registries conflict, Norwegian was positive, the AJR in America was negative. Um, it, it's interesting, these all do show reduction of revision surgeries with it, but not change in the periprosthetic infection rate. I don't, maybe a joint surgeon can explain that to me. Uh, it does affect material properties. The higher concentration you put in there, the weaker your cement will be. And there's no evidence, fortunately, for a selection problem where you're just selecting out a worse organism or developing worse antibiotic resistance. So I, I don't know the role of this, and I'll let the joint arthroplasty surgeons argue about that. Maybe they could tell me. Postoperatively, uh, good healthcare practice uh, is to remove everything as fast as possible, includes IVs. Try not to even put Foley's in. These things all do add up to surgical site infections because you get urinary tract infection, they'll see. Um, avoid dressing changes, short-term antibiotics, and good glycemic control. And the, those three you definitely need to do. You can, when to change the dressing is kind of arbitrary. Uh, and here's the single dose of antibiotics. Uh, again, not showing any difference uh, as I showed before. Uh, there are a few new ap approaches that are coming on the scene. One is vaccination. Uh, there's a vaccine that's being uh, trialed in spine surgery right now. Four different strains of staph. Uh, we'll see what the results are. Uh, there's a big recognition that anemia is a risk factor for uh, surgical site infection and that we ought to back up and if somebody's anemic pre-op and you should look at that Try to correct it. If it doesn't correct, get the patient seen by hematology because there is a strong link to transfusions. And you can avoid transfusions by elevating the, the blood counts before surgery. And then there's a lot of uh, interest, obviously, in preventing biofilm by using smart implants that have coatings or surfaces that uh, you either prevent bacterial adherence or encourage bone ingrowth, which indirectly prevents bacterial occurrence. So uh, prevention is everyone's responsibility. It has to be a systematic approach. You need to get all stakeholders. Uh, the bundled approaches do appear to work. 
And when you're applying these, don't apply dogma. Use best medical evidence. Thank you very much. Paul, that was a great lecture, and uh, thank you. I love the color coding. Um, I have two articles that uh, I'm aware of that I've wondered if you could comment on. One is the total hip people have pretty much standardized the 90 days after uh, hip injections with steroids, and that, uh, and that this is definitely an increased risk if you uh, have had that injection. And I also wondered about uh, epidural steroids <coughs> in spine, because there is an article out of uh, Kurt Wood uh, wrote an article and uh, somewhat suggested that our risks go down 30 days if you have a, an epidural injection. So I wondered if you had any comments on those two articles. Yeah, the, uh, certainly the arthroplasty literature has looked at that a little bit more than the spine, Ted. And uh, my recollection was it was 30 days. Uh, if, you, if they had a knee or hip injection within 30 days, your risk of surgical site infection was higher if you operated then. And uh, as far as spine, that was the only study I've seen. I think epidural steroids have some other untoward events. You actually uh, lose 1% to 2% of bone mass every epidural steroid in the spine uh, as well, which obviously you don't want to do right before surgery. But that's probably something that needs further investigation uh, to look at what the, what the effect of steroids are on surgical site infections, because they are widely used. Thanks so much for your lecture. We have been instituting a bundle at the Children's Hospital this year, and we've been meeting some similar roadblocks that you mentioned, kind of some resistance. How do you feel is the best way to kind of get people on your side and, and increase the usage of the bundle. Yeah, my Lecoque lecture is going to be on quality okay. improvement, and, and that's kind of what I'm going to cover there. But I, I think the, the effective programs I've been able to introduce is start at the top with administration has to decide this needs to happen and tell every one of their managers, and then you assemble the team that is all has stake in it, that you're going to affect their lives, you need to win them over. And they have to be part of the solution. And then you need to have a careful surveillance program. Initially, you're not going to see any change on infection rate, but you can show compliance. And you start advertising, hey, we're 80% compliant. And then you find the ones who aren't compliant and work with them to try to improve it. You advertise it. Transparency is the best changer of behavior. And if you start showing people surgical site infections and all of a sudden Dr. Bella Barber's is five times higher than everybody else's, he might change his behavior. This is a question that was texted in uh, from Dr. Reza Farooz, a body one of our traumatologists at Harborview. Uh, what are your thoughts on self-retaining retractors increasing surgical site infections? Yeah, I don't know. Um, any evidence about that. However, uh, Ted will remember, we used to have these double crank retractors and we'd leave them on for four or five hours and we'd get done and the, the muscle is just blanched, it's pale and dead. And that is not good surgical technique. Uh, I think there's no doubt that minim the one advantage that minimally invasive surgery of the spine has is l a lower infection rate. There's no doubt. And part of that is we're not killing the muscle. And we also need that muscle to do something like uh, help have the patient stand erect. So those double, those high uh, retractors, if you measure the compartment pressures in, in those muscles underneath those retractors, it's quite high. So you, you just can't do that. That's why I prefer Gelpi retractors, which kind of self-regulate themselves. They frequently loosen up. That's kind of what we want. And, but that's also why at the end of the procedure, you need to get rid of devitalized tissue. Yeah, that's an interesting uh, point that uh, Dr. Feruzabadi made because when I was a resident, we were always taught to avoid self-retaining retractors. These were, you know, a, another generation of surgeons that didn't have all the tools we have now and all the studies to, you know, that we can use to decrease infection rate. Uh, 
I even remember one of our total joint surgeons, uh, you know, talking about soft tissue handling would uh, suture moist laps uh, across the incision whenever he was doing a total hip replacement. And, you know, you wonder whether simple things like that, if studied uh, now, would actually also be shown to make yeah. a difference. For instance, general surgery, abdominal surgery, showed that if they put, and I don't know what it is, but uh, uh, they have a screen that collects the chitlins uh, in plastic, and that has been, that's one of their guidelines, right, Patch? Uh, I forgot what they call it, but uh, again, it's how you handle those tissues is very important, because uh, if you leave a bunch of devitalized <laughs> tissue and it happens to get contaminated, it's gonna be a yeah. bacterial logic experiment, as Dr. Moynihan said. Yeah, you know, one more comment and then a question. Uh, going back to Dr. Bauer's uh, question, uh, for, for total joint surgery, what got the administration to uh, really support us, and I know Paul Minner is here who can also comment it, what was the financial pressures, you know, the bundles that, that came from CMS and then, uh, you know, were followed by uh, the commercial insurers and even some of the uh, companies we contract with. Uh, but also the fact that this data is available publicly and, and patients can actually, you know, see it or uh, visiting surgeons from Wisconsin can actually look at our data. And so, so that pressure actually uh, got the administration uh, pretty much to do what, uh, I would say, whatever we needed to build a, a good total joint program at Northwest Hospital, uh, short of a new building, is that right? Yeah, I agree. I mean, yeah, today's landscape uh, with the bundled care, your infection rate better be under a half a percent. Yeah. Uh, yep. And the only way to do it is to adopt most of those measures. Right. And we actually profited by that. I think the hospital the first year, uh, we put our bundles and pathways into place. I, I think they got a return on that investment uh, from CMS of about close to $300,000. And so it, it actually paid off for them. I have a very practical question. For total joint surgery, uh, the reported uh, gram negative infection rate for hips and knees is still about 5% if you look at big series. And yet the CDC and I think the WHO recommendations, are, the WHO recommendations are that if someone is uh, truly penicillin allergic, you should use just vancomycin. Uh, that doesn't give you any gram-negative coverage. And so I was wondering if you have any, any comments on that. And I, I still see the, you know, rare but occasional patient, uh, at least, you know, a couple a year that has a gram-negative infection after a total joint. Um, well, um, the, uh, our infectious disease are not interested in us expanding beyond vancomycin for that. I think the big problem is you better back up and ask what is a beta-lactam allergy? Because what we found was that most people had beta-lactam allergies were not, or even if they did, they were the minor variety where the susceptibility to cephalosporin allergy was non-existent. And what we have now, like an eight-page document that infection disease wrote with allergy, is very complicated. But basically, it comes down to beta-lactam allergy to avoid, that means you should avoid cephalosporin, is you have a history of ana anaphylaxis or angioneurotic edema, or you have high reaction to penicillin. And whatever type uh, allergic reaction, that apparently does correlate with with bad results. So those are the only two things. So the important thing as part of your pre-op plan, and I guess I should build that into this talk, is to interrogate the patient about beta-lactam allergy. And what we're doing now is for every patient going to surgery, we're going to have written in our pre-op documentation a pain management plan and an antibiotic plan. Most of the antibiotic plan will be the same for 95% of them, but there will be these who have some allergies and we will write down ahead of time if we want to overcome this, quote, allergy that's on the EPIC record and still give them cephalosporin. You, you can also do test dose. And if it's important enough, you can always send them to an allergist. Patch wrote those guidelines, so I don't know what your feeling is. Uh, like I say, I tr we try to avoid clindamycin at all costs nowadays. Almost all penicillin allergies are fake. Right. Yeah. So it's really improving everybody's ability to interrogate about that allergy.
Yeah, getting anesthesia on board, that, they were the ones who were unwilling to, to use the cephalosporin, and they hadn't bothered to even ask what their allergy was. And so we had to educate them about it to make any difference, and they're much better now. And our, actually, our pharmacist does the interrogation now, and they kind of give us a stamp of approval for cephalosporin. So we got the pharmacist. That's why on these quality improvement programs, you need a variety of stakeholders, and, and, and pharmacists would be very important for SSI prevention because those, those guys are very sharp. Uh, yeah, thanks for your excellent talk. Um, I was wondering if you could sort of expand a little bit on your future approaches slide and, you know, for the sort of one to two percent of individuals that are still, you know, resistant to some of these interventions, you know, what, what, what you think might make them resistant to these strategies and, and to sort of relate it to that question, I was wondering if there's been any studies to look at whether um, sort of indicators of immune status function in the blood, like, you know, serum cytokine levels or T cell numbers, whether those might be um, predictive of infection risks in some yeah. of these individuals. I didn't cover everything here, obviously. Uh, I think along that lines, one of the important ones would be nutritional status. Uh, and that's controversial about how do you actually measure that? Is serum albumin adequate or do you need to do pre-albumin and, and what are the thresholds for that? But certainly if you are dealing with an undernourished person, uh, you have to consider that. Keep in mind the morbidly obese patient oftentimes are malnourished as well because of their poor diet. So that would be a, a way of looking at that as well. Uh, in terms of other advances, uh, uh, the benzoyl peroxidide washes instead of chlorhexidine because that seems to be much more act, uh, active on acne. And so for children, uh, adolescent scoliosis and shoulder surgery, that, that would certainly be an effective measure. Smarter implants, um, surface treatments and things, uh, there's a big problem getting a coded prosthesis through the FDA because now you have a medical device and a pharmaceutical, and those two branches of the FDA do never talk to each other, and so they have no regulatory pathway to do that. It's amazing, because I go there and we, as representing orthopedics, I say, we need to have antibiotic-coated implants. Here's the data why, and the FDA cannot figure out how to make that happen, unfortunately. Uh, but what you can do is change the surfaces, and if you put nano surfaces you get much faster uh, tissue incorporation and you get less tendency for biofilm. So I think we'll see some engineering solutions to this. The really one, which is put antiseptics or antibiotics on the surface, like people can, we can easily put silver containing things on the surface. And silver is very effective antiseptic, but it just can't get through the regulatory process. Thank you. Uh, vaccination may be a good one. I'm optimistic on that one. We are not. We are not. Uh, it. Hi. Hello. Um, just had a brief question. You know, a lot of these things in the bundles are looking at you know, discrete interventions, and I was wondering, one of the things you mentioned was technique with some of the interventions. How do we study technique, technique of prep and behavior in the operating room, and has anybody looked at that with respect to infection? Well, our, um, that, that's uh, our nurses, uh, monitor, periodically will survey and watch techniques. So some uh, highly experienced good nurse will stand there with a clipboard and check this off and then we will report what the compliance was for everybody, their technique, of whether they passed the technique. Everybody had to go through training on how to prep the skin, uh, all the nurses and the residents. In fact, the nurses didn't want the residents to do it and, and uh, we as the attendings threw a fit and said they have to learn how to do this. And so you could do by compliance measurements and then correlating that to infections. And you will see, and I didn't present, I didn't have time for a lot of the studies, but you could see the more compliance you have with the bundles, the lower your surgical site infection rate is. So, but you have to monitor that. And, and a lot, all the infectious disease programs start with my, uh, surveillance program and they describe what a surveillance, components of a surveillance program. It's a little bit outside what I talked about. But you have to have a surveillance program, and it surveils compliance as well. Uh, 
for instance, uh, I, I took the slide out because of time, but I did have one when we had that spike of infection. I asked, well, are we screening everybody properly? It turned out we also dropped our screening uh, when we added these five surgeons. We, we went below 80% on that screening, which we hadn't for years, uh, and clearly showed a target for opportunity. So uh, those you can look at as opportunities for improvement. Dr. Kringle, good to see you. Paul, first of all, I want to thank you for the unbelievable teaching that Paul did as a staff here. He was probably the best teacher I ever had. Um, two things. Uh, one, do you have any comment on titanium instrumentation versus stainless and cobalt and for spine? And the second is, when, when I look at the NSHN numbers and I compare them to other large prospectively collected uh, studies, um, what I notice is that NSHN data for spine has a much lower infection rate than almost every other prospectively collected study. Um, the, most of them are on the, in the 4% range. Um, and I, I just wondered if you have comment about the reality of the NSHN rates. Yeah, the, um, what is an infection to us is not necessarily an infection to NSHN. Their definition uh, for deep and organ space infection, and uh, they also have one for superficial. None of the numbers I included were superficial, like a stitch abscess or something, but deep infection or a organ space. Organ space would include a joint infection and uh, oste quote osteomyelitis would be considered an organ space infection in our field. Whereas if it was a soft tissue abscess that went below the fascia, it would be considered a deep infection. And they either have to have it identified, the surgeon has to say there is purulence there, or it has to grow something. So as we know, 75% of our wound infections don't grow anything. And also NSHN only goes out 30 days. And I, I know from the scope data uh, that Amy collected, uh, at least, and I don't know, it was one or two percent of those infections occurred after 30 days. And for you, adolescent scoliosis, probably 15 percent of the hardware is colonized with the probably propionobacter long term. Uh, but that doesn't count as a uh, infection in the NSN. So it's it's the definitions are different, and also the time frame. I think it's the time frame makes a big difference. And titanium. Oh yeah, the titanium. So I talk, I didn't talk so much about biofilm, but biofilm is really the nemesis because once you get biofilm on an implant, it's almost impossible to eradicate it without taking out the implant. And different metals are different, have different metallurgical properties that either promote or uh, resist biofilm. Titanium is the most resistant metal to, titanium alloy, most resistant metal to biofilm. So if you're putting something in a high-risk patient, it's probably best to use titanium. Uh, stainless steel is better, is better than cobalt chrome. Cobalt chrome is worse in terms of its propensity. And it has to do with the surface, something property called surface energy and wetness. In other words, it's how well an organism or a cell from our human cell can stick to that thing. Uh, and that's called uh, surface energy. And it turns out that titanium has a uh, much more favorable surface energy. And so in higher risk patients, it's preferable. You can argue in scoliosis, for instance, titanium not being as stiff, are you gonna maintain the correction as well compared to stainless? And you have rod bending problems with fracture of rods, so. But for infection, titanium is superior to any other metal. And plastics are the worst. Uh, peak, for instance, is much more likely to get infected. I don't know about ceramics. I haven't looked at that, but that would be another consideration. Pat, you have any comments? Anything you would do differently? 
Yeah, we, we, we're doing that as well. Uh, I did a study with the hospitalists on uh, measured arthroplasty and spine patients, like 400 of them, and measured the hemoglobin A1C at the time of surgery and their fasting blood sugar. 25% were known had glycemic issues we knew about from their history, but 40% of these people had elevated hemoglobin A1Cs or elevated fasting blood sugars the morning of surgery. We retested though that those who weren't diabetic but had elevated parameters a month later, and like half of them had normalized, so it was more pre-diabetes or something. I don't know what you call it, but uh, but half of them were di actually diabetic, just didn't know it. And so there may be a role for universal blood checks, at least. Uh, yeah, we so we introduced that, and, and immediately we no longer had any uh, glucose strips in our hospital. We ran out, and they were on back order. <laughs> Yeah, I would say of all these bundles, when they do it in children, they see a much bigger effect than adults. It's impressive. Uh, and it's all part of the ARIS program, you, you know, the expedited care for, uh, started out in arthroplasty, but it makes a huge difference here. Thank you, Alan. Good.